Good morning. Anyone but Dennis. Bonus points today if you know what song that was. The Beatles. Let it be. Wes has finally joined mine and Kevin's boat and gave us some Beatles this morning. Lovely. Thank you, Wes. Good morning to, I feel like I'm really loud. Maybe, no comments, I just am really loud, but good morning to our folks. That's better. Good morning to our folks who are online, who may be traveling, who are at home, wherever you may be this morning, whether you're here or you're there. It's like a Dr. Seuss book all of a sudden. Please join me in the call to worship. It's a great day to be here. Just listen for God's call to you. Let God guide your life. Come, let's worship and celebrate God's good news for us. Let us sing. simply come longing just to breathe something that's a word that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required Search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. It's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me. Oh, it's all about you, Lord. King of endless world, no one could express how much you deserve.
come now to the time where we share our joys, we share our concerns, we share our prayer requests. Are there any to share this morning? Angie? Just an update on John. He um, had two appointments this week, um, one at IU and one at Houston, MD Anderson. And they all agree he needs to have this um, third tumor removed. So he's going to have that removed. And then they were going to start some chemo along with his Optune cap. So please continue to pray. And we appreciate it. Definitely. Please, and we know you'll keep us updated. So possibly surgery this week is what they're thinking. Okay. Others to share this morning. Everybody shy. Good morning, Soth. see was it week two week two I watched football yesterday I watched IUN so do we need do we are we am I needing to prep like the legal statement no that, like, you're good we're not service is not sponsored by the NFL or any of its own okay you're good anybody else how are your Green Bay Packers doing, Julie? Not so well. I don't know anything about Green Bay, so I just know that your love for them is, it's like being a Cubs fan, just transcends everything, right? You gotta give IU like the moment, right? They haven't like won very many games in years, so. We, Want to keep Ruby Robertson in our prayers. I uh, got a message that Ruby was taken to the hospital over the weekend. And between me and Angie, one of us is going to try to figure out what's going on with her. Uh, see if we can reach someone in the family. Uh, see if she's still in the hospital. Um, so we'll let folks know. Um, of course, we, Ruby is just too sweet for words. Um, Nancy. And JC sent their hellos this morning. They did get moved to the Indy area, very much thanks to Winoka and Marsha, who helped them pack. Um, Nancy's working this morning, but they hope to see you all soon. Um, and so Martin reminded us to just keep continuing to pray for Ukraine. Also keep continuing to pray for Russia and Israel and Palestine, and so many other wars and skirmishes and battles and whatever you want to call them, we know exist all over the world. Um, update on Gizmo, if you don't know, if you're new here, Gizmo is my dog um, who had cancer surgery over the summer. His paw has been deemed healed. So no more medicines, no more ointments, no more restrictions. The summer of discontent is over. Um, so just hoping that the cancer doesn't come back. Um, and then an update on my niece Kinsley. I asked for prayers for her last week, but said I couldn't give details. Uh, Kinsley is nine and lives in Pendleton with her parents. Um, and she had a choking incident on food about six weeks ago. And that led to a food avoidance, um, and she dropped 15% of her body weight. And as a really skinny nine-year-old, that's a problem. Um, and so she was admitted to Peyton Manning last weekend, and she had a feeding tube put in um, on Monday morning. And they're hoping that will only be in for a couple of months to get her back to normal. Um, 
So prayers appreciated um, continue for her. Um, she is feeling, she's in pain, but it's amazing what nutrition will do through the feeding tube and actually at home sleeping. If you've ever been in the hospital, you know that is not the place for rest. Um, and so, and her family and her parents are the feeders. So prayers for all of them. Any others? And if my mom is watching, happy birthday tomorrow, Marla. Um, see, I'm a good child. I just want to point that out. So I won't tell you how old my mom is. But everyone says she looks real young. Chuck met her the other night. So at a thing at Kendall. But you got anything? You good? Sandy tell you you're good today? All right. And Colin is back to work. He's feeling better. You know, Colin had been on the prayer list. Um, and uh, I saw him the other day. And I kept trying to, I told Stacy, I kept trying to figure out who this kid was who was bagging my groceries. I knew I'd seen him somewhere. And finally, I was like, is Stacy your aunt? And he's like, and you're the pastor. Like, we had apparently been staring at each other, trying to figure out who each other was. Um, so it's good to see that he's feeling back to normal. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. God, we give you thanks for the sunshine. God, we give you thanks for the crops. God, we just give you thanks for all of your creation. God, sometimes we get so bound up and wound up in the ugliness of the world. But God, how easy it is to take a time out and just look at your creation. How easy it is to just see your hand everywhere. And God, that should make us feel better. God, we continue to pray for those in Ukraine. God, we continue to pray for the Russian people who don't really know the truth. God, we continue to pray for those in Palestine and those in Israel. God, we know that that is a battle that's been going on for all of time. But God, there can be peace. There can be shared experiences. And God, we know that just because Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Palestine are at war with each other, it doesn't mean that all their people hate each other. God, we know that there are stories of hope. We know that there are stories of love. God, we continue to pray for our community. God, we continue to pray for our country. God, we continue to pray that senseless acts of violence cease. That our children be safe. That people who are just walking down the street be safe. God, we continue to pray for our first responders. God, we know that their jobs are heavy. And so, God, when we come across them, may we be the hands and feet of Christ. May we just simply say thank you for protecting us, for keeping us safe, for saving our lives. God, our prayer concern list is long. And, God, we pray over each of the people on it. God, all have different ailments, all have different situations. God, we know that you are with each and every one of them, just in like you are, just like you are with each and every one of us. And God, in a time of silent prayer, we lift up to you those things on our hearts and our minds unmentioned. God, we lift 
those burdens to you. Maybe they're things that we can't give to you permanently that we have to deal with. But for this moment of worship, God, we give them to you. God, hear our prayers. God, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord, who taught the disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture, in case you actually looked ahead in the beacon and you memorized all the scripture, show of hands if you did that. Shocking, shocking. It was change. This morning's scripture is Mark 5, 21, 43. A girl restored to life and a woman healed. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touches my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. 
While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to him, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Author and humorist Mark Twain once said, courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not absence of fear. Also about courage, poet, essayist, and playwright T.S. Eliot said, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. Does anyone here have a definition of courage this morning? Roy, you got any? walking dictionary knowledge for us this morning? Sure. (laughs) What is courage? When I say courage, I think the cowardly lion from the Wizard of Oz, right? Courage. Our friends at Merriam-Webster Dictionary define courage as mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. So let's keep that in mind as we go on. This morning we're going to focus our attention on the unnamed woman in the scripture who had to find her courage. This woman's story only fills 10 spaces in Mark's gospel. Blink and in the scheme of biblical matters, you may miss it. Show of hands if before this reading this morning, you remembered a lot of detail about the woman with the issue of blood. She's one of my favorites. It's a story within a story. This narrative is often referred to as an interrupt as interrupting a greater story, that of the healing of the young girl. And we're able to hear that interruption this morning as we read it together. Is there more to this woman's situation than just an interruption? Is she more than just an interruption? More than just another person needing a healing from Jesus? What is it that we can learn from this lady? Let's hear the part of the scripture that focuses just on her again. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under physicians and had spent all she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately where the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. We know this woman has been suffering from an issue of blood from hemorrhages for 12 years. 12 years is a long time to suffer from anything but especially this. I'm looking at Nurse Sharon. I think you can agree. This would be a long time. This this would get you a hysterectomy these days, right? Like, this is very serious. In today's society, bodily functions are still taboo, right? You know, two-year-olds, they have, like, a favorite bodily function they like to talk about. But beyond that, generally bodily bodily functions are taboo. Even with all those personal hygiene, right, and care commercials on TV and us dealing with our own hygiene, 
if I stood up here today and said, let's talk about menstrual cycles, show of hands if you would be totally for that conversation. Why not? My grandpa, anytime a Tampax commercial would come on, he would look at like me, my grandma, whoever, and go, you ladies have to buy those anyway. Why do they need a commercial for it, <laughs> right? You're going to need it anyway. What's the point? It's not like it's selling you more of them. But if I said that this morning, everyone would be wildly uncomfortable, right? But what this woman in the scripture is dealing with is wildly uncomfortable for her. Perhaps we don't see or appreciate the importance of this woman's situation. Perhaps this, such, this woman's situation is too much personal information even for us in today's world, where we think we're way more cultured than past societies, right? We have to realize the issue that this woman is dealing with would make her ritually unclean in her time. And being ritually unclean in the Jewish world in the time of Jesus is a big deal. Being ritually unclean gets you isolated, it gets you segregated, it gets you put on the outskirts of town, away from family and friends, no contact because she could make them unclean as well, and then they would have to be isolated from others, and they couldn't go to the temple like she can go to the temple, right? When this woman walks down the road, people probably go to the other side or as far away from her as possible. She is seen as a plague. She is seen as less than human. You imagine for a bodily function that we all know females have, and now she has an issue with it. But here is what's happening from a medical condition. Every And here's the thing. Show of hands if you love having your whole community know all of your medical details. Everyone knows about this lady's medical condition. How flustering, how embarrassing, right? And it makes her a community liability. There were theories in the time of Jesus and into the next several centuries that a woman in her condition could do anything from killing someone with a touch to taking away their power. She'd be seen as more than simply cursed. She would be seen as paying a fuller price for Eve's apparent sin in the garden during the first century. We know this woman has endured hardship at the hands of the physicians, the scripture tells us. This is ironic given that doctors are supposed to alleviate suffering, not make it worse. Now we learn something extremely important in verse 26. We learn this woman has spent all her money on physicians. This indicates that at one time she was somewhat wealthy. Physicians in her time are insanely expensive and the, time, the type of treatment she would be seeking, considering it would involve a physician interacting with someone who would be ritually unclean, would be very expensive. Plus, 12 years of any kind of medical care, her time, our time, would be outrageous to afford, right? We can assume that since no one has control over her money, after she becomes an outcast, she is probably a widow. Also, her being in control of her own medical treatment and money further goes to show her isolation from family and friends. No male relative is taking responsibility, right? She's not supposed to be owning things. She's not supposed to really be on her own. There should be a male family member taking care of her, stepping up for her, speaking for her. But there's no male around. So she's definitely on her own. Now we're told that this woman has heard about Jesus, and this is why she's in the crowd. We're not told that she saw him perform a miracle and believed. We're not told that she had met him some other time. No one sent her to find Jesus, right? She had simply heard about him. 
She heard there was this guy walking around, people were referring to him as the son of God, and they say he has the power to heal. Now put yourself in her shoes. What would you think if you heard that? Would there be any doubt on your part as to whether it was true? Right? Maybe the first time she heard it, she had her doubts, but she pushes away that doubt and she sees this as her last resort as having the chance to have a normal life back. She has the courage to go into the crowd and there are people probably trying to get away from her. Oh no, here she comes. We'll call her Sally today. I don't know why. Here comes Sally. We need to get away from her, right? We already have our own problems. We don't need hers too, whatever she's inflicting. Everyone would have known that she could make them unclean. She would have been accidentally brushing up on people. We've all been in crowds, right? Concerts, basketball, football, right? You name it, plays. We've all been, airports, those are always fun. We've all been somewhere where we've brushed up against people. And you can tell we're from the Midwest because what do we say when we accidentally bump into someone? We say, oh, sorry about that. And this would be no different. She would be bumping into people and there would be consequences for her, but she doesn't care. The woman thinks that if she can just touch his garment that she'll be made well. If she could just touch the fringes of his garment, she doesn't even need to touch the whole robe or whatever it is he's wearing. Just let me touch the fringes of it and my nightmare will be over. She doesn't consider making an appointment with him or his disciples. She knows what she needs and she goes for it. She has to step out in faith and this is literally the only thing she has left. How much courage would it take to touch Jesus, right? I don't like touching people. Like I'll go up to Roy and slap my hand on his shoulder, right? Roy and I have known each other for a long time at this point. You know, I'll go slap Ronnie. I feel like Ronnie and I sort of have this, I can slap you on the back kind of mentality. But imagine, we don't like to touch people we don't know let alone how much courage it would take to touch Jesus. Could you be so bold as to even sneak a quick touch of his garment without asking permission, especially if you are possibly going to make him ritually unclean? She has the courage to believe there's some sort of power residing in Jesus that can be stored and even transferred to other people by just touching his garment. What if simply touching his garment fails? What if she actually needs him to touch her, lay hands on her for the healing to work? This is where faith and courage come in, and she is bold in them. In his play, Cymbeline, William Shakespeare wrote, Boldness, be my friend. I love that. Boldness, be my friend. The woman in today's scripture has boldness as her friend. Just by that simple touch of Jesus' garment, her hemorrhage is stopped. Her curse has ended. She's been healed from not just the disease, but she's been healed of being a disease in her community, as seen as being a disease on her community. Imagine that transformation. The woman had hoped to stay private. We could imagine she wanted to just slink away, right? Be like, I got my healing. It's time to go. Look, fam, I feel better. She'd even hoped to remain in secrecy from Jesus. However, Jesus is immediately aware that the power has gone out from him. He wants to know who touched his clothes had the courage to touch his clothes and his disciples don't understand the question. Jesus, we are in a large crowd of people. Everyone is touching your clothing, right? Everyone is touching me, so everyone is touching you. I hate that. That's my big thing about being in, like, going to a sporting event or a concert. I don't like all that, like, pushing in. 
You're like, Jesus, is this a real question? Everyone's touching us. The disciples don't understand the situation. They're so focused on their task of getting to the little girl who is dying, which is an important task, obviously, but they're only focused on one miracle today. And man, is it a high-ranking miracle because it's the child of a synagogue leader. So they're marching, right? Just focused on that one miracle. They seem to be no time for anything else. Jesus looks around to see who it was. Will someone admit to touching him for a healing? Would you? The woman is no coward. She had the courage to touch his garment. She has the courage to come before Jesus, and she admits that she did. And she comes in fear and trembling and falls down before him. And we know that reading the Old Testament, that this is the standard response to the appearance of God. She tells Jesus the whole truth. I love that the scripture says she tells him the whole truth, right? She doesn't tell him the truth, she tells him the whole truth. Joe is not here this morning, but in the court they say, will you tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Don't leave anything out. I will tell you the whole truth, Jesus. She says, here is why I did it. Here is what has been happening to me. Here has been my life for 12 agonizing years. I have suffered at the hands of doctors. We know that she suffered at the hands of doctors. How did we know that before? Because she tells Jesus the whole truth. And that's where that info comes from. And we can identify with her more than anxious, likely anxiousness while she explains herself. If just touching his garments will heal her, then who knows what the punishment might be for being so bold as to essentially steal a healing from God. What would the punishment be for possibly making him ritually unclean while he's on the way to the home of a synagogue leader for a healing? Because not only would she make him unclean, but he would touch the synagogue leader's daughter and it would make her unclean. And then it would make the parents, you know, there's a tra- chain reaction here. So they thought. Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And we imagine that her response is relief. She probably lets out a breath. She didn't know that she had. She probably weeps, but we're not told that. But we would have to, 12 years of suffering, we would assume that there would be some weeping involved. There would be no negative consequences for having the courage and faith that God could heal through Jesus the Christ. In fact, the use of the word daughter here implies that Jesus now sees her as one of the family. She has a new family among the faithful, when she had no one, no family, no friends, no one beside her, she had Jesus. She only had rumors to go on, but she had the courage to believe and to experience God's healing power and redemptive love. Her faith has saved her. She had the courage to let God have control. She had the courage to have faith. We have to ask ourselves, do we have the courage to experience faith? I'm not talking about the superficial faith. I'm talking like the deep and gritty faith that takes work. Do we have the courage to experience God fully? In other words, do we have the experience, do we have the courage to experience God on God's terms and not us? Do we have the courage to let God have control? That's the hardest one, right? For being honest. Us people of free will. Do we have the faith that we can grab onto God for any reason without permission, like the woman grabbed onto the garments of Jesus? 
When Jesus asked who touched him, the woman and others were probably concerned about his reaction. And I think that is, you know, probably the right response. I would be concerned. But if anyone thought there would be negative reactions from Jesus, they were wrong. What they get instead from Jesus is a lesson from the church, from Christians, for the followers of the way on how to be inclusive and loving. The church isn't Jesus. Jesus doesn't just reside right here in the sanctuary of First Christian Church, right? Bring him out on Sunday, put him back in a box for the rest of the week. The church in the world isn't called to be the Savior. It's called to be the hands and feet of Christ. To be a reflection of love and a beacon of hope. It's to be a hospital for the broken. It's called to follow in the footsteps of the one who calls us. The church doesn't have the power to miraculously heal someone's disease. You know, we're not bringing people in here. I'm not laying hands on them and they're not hopping up like I'm Benny Hinn. Show of hands if you ever watched Benny Hinn. We need to work on the TV and movies, guys. Come on. Benny Hinn is the one TV preacher that when people had ailments, he would apparently lay hands on them, and they would suddenly be healed. And now there are all these stories about how maybe that was not accurate and not real. But he's got a lot of jets. He's got a lot more money than I do. So... But the church doesn't have the miraculous ability to heal people. But the church does have the obligation to be God's representative on earth. It does have the obligation to help remove the stigma from those who are different from those who are suffering. The church must live up to its responsibility of welcoming all caring for all of God's children, and to never put anyone on the fringes of the society like today's woman in the scripture. It's the job of the church to go to the fringes, and I think the fact that we go to places like St. Martin's to help serve food is a good example of one of those ways we're going to the fringes, right? Because not only do we go just give them food, if you've never been to St. Martin's, there's a whole lot of conversation that goes on with people as well, especially if it's Paul, right? I think Paul knows every person in Marion. Um, Because it's more than just food. It's literally interacting with those people on the fringes and they're wanting prayers. How often do we get prayer requests that come back from that. They don't even know us. But they just think, if those people will pray for me, we can just go out to the fringes and find the woman and others who have been cast out and show them the love of God, not the hypocrisy of the church, but the love of God. To show them the love of Christ instead of treating people like diseases on society, we in the church need to embrace them as God does now more than ever. Church should be giving people the courage to live in the world and experience God no matter what their situation is. The church should be giving people the courage to experience faith and to live it out. Remember what Shakespeare said? Boldness be my friend. Let boldness be the friend of the church while it reaches out to God and reaches out to help God's children. This ends this morning's word. We give thanks to God. Let us sing our communion hymn.
the cross, so we share, so we share in this bread. So with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body. Whether it's the first time we've ever gathered around the table or the thousandth, what we can be sure of is God's love for us. And that is what this table shows. Because we remember on the night that he was arrested, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. After dinner, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the covenant for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we take this bread and we take this cup, we proclaim his death from this world as we know it until he comes again. The gifts of God for the children of God. All are welcome at the Lord's table. Let us pray. There is nothing great and wonderful that you do not create, O God. The world and all that is in it, your laws and commandments, show us your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, we gather at this table, proclaiming your greatest work, the resurrection. As we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we are recipients of your great and saving works. In thanksgiving, we honor your name. Let us take the bread and the cup.
Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. I didn't even ask for announcements yet, Sharon. But apparently Sharon has an announcement. Yes, I do. And this is a wonderful opportunity offered by uh, Marion Health. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetime, so early detection is key. Marion Health is offering a free skin cancer screening and I have some flyers out there with the number on it, so pick it up. But also, um, along with that, we did uh, community lab draws, parish nursing did at the hospital for years. Well, COVID ended that. But you can get a wellness panel uh, for $20, and this includes uh, a complete blood count, glucose, liver function, kidney function, anemia, thyroid, and lipids, which is cholesterol screening. So pick up one of these. They're just on the table outside if you're interested. And um, it gives you a number, and you have to call and make an appointment. But it's just a remarkable amount of free, free or very low-cost health care. I'm done. That sounds way cheaper than my last blood draw at my doctor's office. <laughs> so... Pick up one of those flyers, y'all. Or if you know someone who might need one, um, and we can always print more if we need more. So other announcements. We got a board meeting this week, yeah? Is that this week? You look really thrilled about it, board chair. Oh, are you going to talk to JoJo and figure it out? Okay, if you're a board member, watch for an email that will either tell you we're having a board meeting on Wednesday or no board meeting on Wednesday. Just got to talk to Joseph, the vice chair. Because um, if there's no business, why are we meeting? Dave, Dr. Dave. I would just like to point out, I did not mention Purdue. Your son-in-law did. Just want to point that out. I don't really remember much of your sermon, but last week you said if you can't if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. So I've been real quiet. But anyway, there was a golf tournament yesterday, Grant Ford Golf Tournament, and Izzy's on the Oak Hill team. And this hole, they said in the program it was 160 yards, but I know it wasn't more than 100 because it was really short. But anyway, she, she hit the ball on the green about five feet left of the hole, and it rolled to the right within this close of having a hole in one. She shot terrible the rest of the time, but that one was really good. No, she was, uh, her team won the Grant Four. Yeah, they did, and she was the fourth in the county. She was the fourth scorer in the county. So, And the little one there ran in that down close to Sin City, and Southern Indiana and Brown County yesterday, and she was in the top third of, there was like 25 teams and a couple hundred runners, and she was 34th, so. so she, she'd, like to be, she'd like to be known as the middle one, not the little one. Well, she's both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any others? Grandpa just likes to give a hard time, Izzy. You wouldn't know what to do if he didn't. <laughs> so, youth next Sunday, 4.30 to 6, all ages. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I thought our snacks, because we canceled last week, because everyone had a sporting thing. I thought our snacks had been stolen. They were just, Stacy and I looked for them. They were just on a shelf. I was like, man, who ate all these snacks? So. Any other announcements? St. Martin's, you need help. You got enough help? All right. This is why the two ladies just 
the husbands are off to the side. They just do it. So, all right, got all the help we need. No other announcements? Going once, going twice. Wes is not even back there, and I, that's Bella. Hey, Bella. That's Wes. Let us say our benediction together. Gathered, we see God in our lives. Gathered, we hear from God's word. Gathered, we sing our praises to God. Gathered, we commune at the Lord's table. Dispersed, we shall share the love of God with the world. Go in peace, go in love, enjoy your lunch, and all God's children said...